So we have uh, a, a panel discussion on uh, 3D in the home, how close are we? And uh, that I think is code for 3D television in the home. Because obviously we have 3D in, at home because uh, I'm able to move about my home. And if it were only 2D, I wouldn't be able to go anywhere. I would be stuck to a plane. Um, so we have uh, here uh, on the panel uh, Brett uh, uh, Breyers, who is uh, from the United States Display Consortium. Art Berman, who uh, represents himself. Uh, and then we have uh, Mark Finn, who uh, is uh, in charge of uh, several newsletters, including uh, an excellent newsletter about uh, 3D displays. And at the end, we have Steve Smith, who uh, perseveres with uh, V-Rex. Um, so I'm, uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm gonna, we can start with Steve and move down the panel. And we can just have uh, each one of these guys uh, say what they think about the uh, possibilities of three-dimensional television in the home. And uh, it's a chance to be a, a seer, to look into the future, possibly the short-term future. Um, but uh, Steve, why don't you uh, begin? Uh, thank you, Lenny, for the uh, introduction. And uh, when this initial topic came up, it was uh, it went through a number of different versions of names and what's the topic going to be about. But I think it was good that it settled on the issue of what it could potentially be the broadest market for a technology that all of us hold so near and dear that we've been coming to these meetings for the last 19, 18 years. Um, I think as you look at trying to break this up, and I'm kind of sitting in this seat from a couple of different vantage points, uh, managing a company that has stereoscopic products as well as having worked in a research laboratory at the Media Lab developing prototypes for autostereoscopic and stereoscopic displays, it's, I think you can start to look at this in an interesting way. Uh, first off, there are workable solutions on the hardware side already available, and I'm sure a number of different panels are going to add viewpoints that are very impertinent in that aspect, but with uh, time sequential displays like shutter glass based displays with DLPs, uh, you have very workable, high quality, what you want to call full resolution uh, capable systems. Um, you have some systems that are getting to be available in the uh, spatially multiplexed area, um, Philips and uh, LG are producing product that for an early adopter are beginning to show potential. In auto stereoscopic display, um, when you look at other types of technologies related to that, they're getting closer. But I would maybe want to position the question as are they close enough yet? Um, on the content side, and this is where you start to look at a much more complex arrangement of what needs to be the tool set, you can kind of, you know, I think substantiate that Real D and Lenny's group has created a platform where there is a product delivery pipeline for CG developed content uh, that's already getting out there and potentially that could become a basis of content that would be available for home systems. Um, but as soon as you start to look at other areas, uh, one being 2D to 3D conversion, uh, which would open the biggest library of existing content uh, to be potentially replayed through a home system, and you add perhaps 2D to 3D conversion as maybe one methodology to approach the issue of live content streaming, um, then you know there I'd have to feel that that is the, the jury's still out. Is there adequate technology for that? Especially when you have to look at the fact, and I think Janice brought this up indirectly. These are large format systems that are in, going to be implemented. People aren't going to be interested in doing 3D in the home on a 20-inch monitor or a 24-inch monitor. You know they've invested in 50, 65 inch, we're seeing uh, companies like Samsung and LG coming out with 72 and 100 inch scale systems that are 1920 by 1080 I and P. 
And the 3D has to work at that level, at that scale, for an adopter to say, yeah, this is ready for me. Um, and there, there's an interesting set of issues that are not as well resolved. You know, are you going to do um, two-channel capture and a depth map, and then leave all the decoding on the uh, receiver side, and they will set: Do I have a two-view system? Do I have a six-view system? Do I have a nine-view system? Um, and, and also issues related to compression and streaming. Uh, there, I think you have less of a clearly defined um, parameter set that gets you into that. Okay, well, thank you. Steve. Maybe I went let's, too long, sorry. Let's, let's, let's move down the uh, food chain here and go to Mark. Uh, my name is Mark Finn. I, um, for those of you don't, who don't know me, I publish a series of newsletters about the displays industry. One of them is uh, specifically about 3D displays. I sit on this panel, I must confess, um, a little awkwardly because my wife and I decided several years ago th that television, whether it was standard definition or high definition or 3D or any other form, um, generally doesn't come with the content quality uh, th th that we want to have in our home. So, so I don't have television in my home. I write about it all the time, um, but, but, but until the, the content providers come up with something that's worth watching, I, I've made the decision not to watch television. Now, don't be mistaken, I watch lots of films and I have several TV devices in my home, uh, um, but, but the specific question of, of 3D television is a little bit awkward for, for me to address simply because it doesn't matter to me uh, um, yet. Now that's copping out a, a bit because I actually believe that 3D is going to be in the home and it's going to be in the home in a big way. I just don't see it happening initially with TV. I see it happening properly with gaming or, or maybe handheld sort of devices. But, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that some more. Well, well Art, um, let's hear your views. It's too bad people didn't hear what we were talking about before the meeting started, but uh, let's continue. <laughs> Actually, I might mention that uh, part of the reason I was selected for the panel is that I'm uh, currently working on uh, behalf of Insight Media in the preparation of a 3D industry report on the uh, state of the uh, union in 3D. And in preparing for the session today, I uh, created a mental list of all of the positive business and technological reasons why 3D would succeed in home video and also the difficulties and problems as to uh, why it would not. I found myself thinking sort of in terms of on one hand it will, on one hand it won't, and it occurred to me that to get the most effective uh, panel discussions you really should hire engineers with only one hand to make the presentation. I've always looked at uh, video in the home as sort of the holy grail for 3D. The ultimate success will be when homes have 3D televisions. And I guess my bottom line opinion is that right now, uh, television is digesting a lot in going to high definition television and large screens and all of the new digital formats and also with uh, video on demand. And that people are buying new and very expensive TVs for the home right now. They're not going to want to buy another one. And if 3D isn't integrated into the TVs that they're buying now, it'll be many years before they choose to buy another one with 3D capabilities. Oh, thank you, Art. And now we'll move to Brett. Thanks, Lenny. Uh, my name is Brett Breyers. Uh, I'm from the U.S. Display Consortium. Uh, I'm new to the 3D industry. Um, I'm not new to displays. I've been working in the display industry for 20 years. Uh, probably the past 12 years have been primarily in consumer uh, television space. So uh, my perspective today on this panel is really coming from the consumer TV side. Um, in, in terms of 3D, you know, I, I can see 3D coming into the home maybe in four different places. Um, one is going to be in your pocket. And that might be your mobile, it might be a PDA, it might be your kid's PSP or, you know, whatever you can fit in your pocket. Um, the second place is going to be in your office. You're going to have a computer uh, with a monitor. Um, the third place might be in your home theater. 
projection systems. And then the fourth place is going to be in your living room. And that's where you're going to have your standard TV. Um, I can envision 3D coming into the home in the first three spaces, you know, in some kind of time frame. The last one, where it's in your living room, um, that's where I have a lot of trouble seeing um, 3D TV really um, taking a big space for quite a long time. Um, uh, thank you. I, I would like to point out that this is uh, a, uh, an audience participation session. And if you've got questions or comments, uh, we'd love to hear them because it's a big room. Uh, you know from the conference and how it's uh, proceeded, it's really hard to hear people. So uh, Neil Dodgson, who's dressed in purple, we asked him to wear purple so that you would be able to find him. If you've got a, a question or a comment, you just come up to Neil. And uh, once again, he's the man with the purple tie and the purple shirt. So just head on up there. So um, I know that uh, the work that my company and I uh, are doing was, was mentioned. Um, but Realty is a company that um, licenses uh, or leases uh, stereoscopic projection equipment for uh, DL, uh, DLP cinemas. So uh, we have uh, a number of uh, theaters now in the world, and there's a steady stream of content that will be produced by the major studios, not just CGI. There will be live action uh, movies uh, from Fox, but often movies that are described as tentpole movies, big movies, are a combination of CGI and live action. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at uh, green screens of Journey to the Center of the Earth and looking at actors who are uh, against a green background, screaming at non-existent monsters. Uh, it's very interesting. So there are going to be a bunch of 3D movies coming, especially in 2008, we'll see a lot of 3D movies. We've also tested these movies on smaller screens. One of the things that people have asked me about was how do they look when they're shot for a 40-foot screen? How do they look on a 40-inch screen? And they honestly look perfectly fine. Um, so it's a surprising answer. But the uh, eye brain is able to adjust. So content which is produced for a large screen will look OK on a small screen. Uh, vice versa, it may not work because there are issues with parallax. The introduction of the stereoscopic uh, television medium for the home is going to be very complicated. What Real-D was able to accomplish in terms of uh, creating uh, a stereoscopic cinema as, I believe, a viable business uh, is enabled, there are only 25 people in real D, but we have industry contacts. The motion picture business is a relatively insular business, so a company in Beverly Hills can have relationships with all of the major studios, uh, talk to the directors, the producers, studio heads, heads of distribution, and um, promulgate the idea and market it uh, in a very nice theater. We have a, a theater that used to be Kirk Kirkorian's theater in a building that was built for MGM. So we can bring people by and show them what we're doing. We've also set up a number of theaters and screening rooms in the, in the Los Angeles area. Because Los Angeles is a movie town. It's, uh, you know, if, if you don't live there, uh, it's so hard to uh, believe. But it really is a, a very intense business with writers and directors, producers, and um, on the other hand, the exhibition business, so I, I talked a little about content creation of movies, and the exhibition business is also a tight business uh, in which everybody knows everybody. So by having one uh, marketing maven who was a former exhibitor, we were able to reach the major distribution chains. So for Monster House, uh, we had, um, I think, about 235 theaters, and that was, in, um, that was four or five months ago in 12 countries. For, um, that was a Sony Imageworks uh, release. Uh, for um, Meet the Robinsons, which is a Disney uh, movie in uh, March 30th, we'll have 500 theaters. Uh, we're installing more and more theaters. These are essentially theaters with the Z-screen modulators and special silver screens. Um, and I've, if you've seen, I wonder how many people have seen uh, recent 3D movies in a real D theater. So, and I think you'll, the way the movie looks in the, in the theater you went to looks just the way it does in our screening room. It's uniformly good. Uh, so we hear really good reports and the system doesn't break down. But what the studio people want from a 3D movie, the people who are into the uh, exhibition end of it, they want an experience that's different from what you've got in the home because 
theater attendance for the past several years, up until this year, was falling off. The motion picture business is a cyclical business. So sometimes you know, it just depends on how good the movies are. On the other hand, so in order to differentiate what they've done in order to bring people to the movies, stereo is very good. 3D movies do three times the box office uh, than uh, the 2D version of the movie. They do very, very well. So that was a decisive argument for the studio heads, and that's why there's a lot of stereoscopic uh, production from Paramount and Fox and all the major studios, except I think Universal. Um, but on the, those companies also want to be able to really release those movies in, uh, in the home because they make uh, half of their revenue from uh, the uh, DVD sales. So uh, it's a paradox because on the one hand they want to be able to get people into the theaters with a unique experience and on the other hand uh, that uniqueness will evaporate once stereoscopic television is ubiquitous but it will take many many years for that to occur because it's a gigantic infrastructure problem. Unlike what Realty has been able to accomplish in the theatrical film industry in one town in Los Angeles was relatively easy if you've got the right connections and know the right people, um, making the television infrastructure, the cable operators, the broadcast people, the producers, the set manufacturers, the people who make the cameras, in order to have that happen, that is going to be an enormous uh, problem or uh, challenge, you could put a positive spin on it. So, um, you know, having said that, uh, I'd like to hear from my fellow panelists or audience members who have any opinions. I, I've sort of looked at it from a marketing point of view uh, and an infrastructure point of view rather than a, a technology point of view. Because I agree with uh, what Steve said. I think uh, the technology may not be the issue in the long run, uh, but uh, it's uh, going to take a, a lot of effort to get disparate groups to cooperate. So. Any comments, or have I said the final word? Could you, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have a question at that point, what I think is very important, the content counts. Pardon me? Yeah, what, what, your name? Oh yeah, my name is Lutz Moer from the 3DCC in Europe. Um, I also think content is the most important thing. Um, but unfortunately, uh, 3D content from the past is not available today uh, in a big approach as stereo format in DVD form. In, in the IMAX, or case other technology, but I think out of over 30 uh, publications or a production, we have just how many in uh, 3D available? I think uh, Andrew's even knowing it better, maybe 10 yeah, or, or less, I'm not sure. How will it be with these new productions? Uh, you said, okay, the, the big producers like to make it available principle for home. What will be first? Availability of um, the content to be played in 3D also at home, or the hardware, the chicken and egg? Right, right, right. So well, well, it, anybody on the panel wants Steve? Can may I, let me maybe try to answer some of that. Um, <laughs> I think that in one case, this is why I brought up the CG content, and again, Lenny, you outlined it really well. It was a small captured paradigm. You could fit all the solutions to their problems. But when you take a look at trying to get television content, and that goes all the way from news broadcast to a young production company that wants to produce some hip series, you have to solve a whole bunch of other stuff, which just briefly would be like you know working with companies like NVIDIA, who gratefully joined as a sponsor here, getting the correct drivers for the graphics cards, um, working with people like Adobe and Apple to have the appropriate plugins for Final Cut Pro and Adobe Premiere so that there's an editing face for these people, uh, not even having addressed the fact what, where does some young director or producer go to learn about stereo and understand it within the context of today's equipment. And then you have another really crucial infrastructure. There's been a lot of talk here because this is you know, on the display side, there's a lot of weight with trying to solve the display side. But there's hardware related to equipment and synchronization and data capture uh, that's on the camera side. And companies like um, 
light speed design, uh, 21st century, cobalt, you know, these are companies that are trying to big rigs, build rigs. So as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty big uh, soup of ingredients that we have to find the right mix and then make it workable for that adopter to say, yeah, I can do 3D and I'm gonna take something on. I think to, to add to that as well, um a, a crucial thing to make a, a television work is going to be some level of standardization. Um, you know, NTSC um, originated in 1941. There weren't really very many televisions at all around then. The only modification of the NTSC standard came in 1951, uh, and that added color. It was a very small modification. Um, 1951, there was nothing being broadcast in color. Um, there, that didn't happen until 1954, and there really weren't any TVs available for several years after that. Um, same with ATSC, the HD TV standards. Um, it's, the standard was created years b b before that the televisions uh, were created, let, let alone all the things Steve just mentioned. With 3D television, uh, unless it piggybacks onto the existing standards, um, we haven't even got to that point. We have to create some standards for, for broadcasting television in 3D but before we can, can uh, move beyond or move to thinking about putting 3D in the home. So, uh, Brent, I can feel you want to speak. I do. Um, I want to uh, refer to the to the HD TV experience um, and uh, kind of build on what Steve was talking about, but maybe just go up one level. Uh, there is a chicken and egg problem, and it's a three-way fight, or has been a three-way fight in HD TV between uh, the broadcasters, uh, between the people who provide the studios, who make the content and provide the content, and then the companies who provide the hardware. Um, the the broadcasters uh, they they don't want to change anything that they're doing. They don't want to buy new equipment because they say, okay, there's no hardware out there. There's no content for me to to me to for me to broadcast. So why am I going to go off and spend all this money to broadcast? It's not out there. The studio content people are, are arguing that there's no hardware and that there's no mechanism to broadcast, so they don't want to spend their money. And then the hardware guys are saying, well, I'm not going to make consumers, I'm not going to spend my own money to develop the technology and, and make consumers buy extra hardware when there's nothing for them to watch. So that's been the classic HDTV uh, situation. And then to kind of build on what Mark said, yes, there does need to be standards, but um, what happened in the US was the government had to get, in, had to get involved and say, you know, we want this to happen, and it has to happen by this particular time frame. We need standards, we need everybody to, to play here, but we're going to set a timeline, and this is when it's going to get implemented, and that's when it's going to happen. Just having standards and just having the technology is one piece of it, but, you know, to be honest with you, I think the government's going to have to get involved at some point, and industry is going to have to convince the government that it is, when is the right point to actually, you know, set a timeline for that. Well, I can, I can tell Art that you'd like to speak next. I can tell your body language. You waved at me, so go ahead. That usually does it. Right. I guess I'd like to suggest a scenario. Uh, the chicken and egg phenomenon, I believe, here is very real. Content will appear when people have displays in their home, but they won't have displays in their home until there's content. But in the absence of government taking the action to include 3D in the broadcast uh, protocols, it'll be consumer demand that drives uh, the industry to put high de uh, 3D televisions in the home. And the scenario I see is that the products that people will encounter first with 3D are likely to be cell phones and advertising. When they become familiar with that, they'll want it at home. And then the consumer demand will occur, and then the industry will respond, and then in third place, the government will come and do something about it. Okay, that, that, that's interesting. Um, making short-term predictions is, is very, very difficult. Um, and um, if we try to understand what patterns may occur in the future based on the past, Mark talked about the introduction of NTSC television. Um, it took 20 years after the introduction of NTSC television to achieve about a 50% market penetration. Uh, RCA uh, and its licensees spent billions of dollars in today's dollars to uh, achieve that. And you know, it took many years after that for uh, color television to be uh, fairly decent in quality. So I just wonder whether or not we're going to see a uh, decades-long introduction of stereoscopic television. However, 
Uh, you know, why don't you come on up? Uh, and however, th we live in a different universe because when NTSC television, color television was introduced, there really was only um, UH, uh, VHF. There was a very high frequency broadcast. There wasn't anything else. There were uh, no uh, cassette tapes. There were no uh, DVDs. Um, you didn't have 200 cable channels, and you didn't have uh, PlayStations that could plug into the TV. So stereoscopic television could enter uh, in a way through the back door, uh, through any one of these uh, mediums, and rather than through broadcast television per se. So Julian, uh, Thanks, we're ready Eddie. for your question. Uh, my name is Julian Flack, and I'm from uh, DDD. Uh, I'd certainly agree that you know, the infrastructure requirements for sort of introducing 3D TV are, are enormous, and I can see that that would be a long time frame. Excuse me. But uh, the question I have for the panel is, do you think it's possible that technologies like DVD distribution or internet distribution, which you can't really discount in this day and age, uh, can, can kind of kickstart that industry and, and, and solve the chicken and egg situation? So if, for example, uh, the content producers that spend a lot of money on creating and converting uh, 3D content wanted to see another outlet for this on, say, DVD or through some sort of internet uh, infrastructure, do you think it's possible that that could short circuit some of these standards and, and get to the industry before you know, the TV standards, the broadcast standards have to be laid down, i.e. is there a possibility that this thing can happen shorter than in the you know, really long time frame that we're talking about at the moment? Okay, that, that's interesting. Who'd like to, Steve? Well, let me, I think that's a really good question, and I, I think part of the solution is how to solve the value proposition for those people to provide it. How do you get the motivation? So I think, you know, first off, we have an interesting issue, a real D and the cinema people that have invested in 3D and that very high-end theatrical experience, you know, it may take a while for them to be compelled to, say, provide that content on the home level because they're making a strong case for keeping theatrical 3D, you know, some reason you're going to get out of your home and go to the cinema. But I believe that's an important part of the equation. Getting that content onto stereoscopically uh, encoded HD DVD and Blu-ray DVDs. Um, gaming, uh, again you look at backdooring it like Julian brought up and getting these early adopters to say, look, here's a, um, a number of different technologies that exist on the display. Let me go ahead and put together a 3D game and DVD system. That'll help solve the value proposition for the content developers and streamers like cable. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, I think that every one of the display technologies that's available, rear projection, television, plasma panels, or um, liquid crystal flat panels, all of those, are capable, one way or another, of producing stereoscopic images. Do you think that the public will accept uh, stereoscopic television with eyewear as selection devices? Or, as Phillips believes, um, will it be an auto-stereoscopic system that will prevail? That's a, that's a good question. And I think people are putting out s solutions to see what the adoption is. You know, when, my feeling is, get to a short answer is when autostereoscopic solutions can be full high definition, the answer is a no-brainer. That's the way to go. I still feel that when, you know, and again, maybe I have a vested position in part of this, but high definition is an important part of my viewing experience, either in a movie or in a game. To so then drop back to 250 pixels, I'm not too excited about. But right but, now, uh, so individual selection devices have a tremendous technical edge. They provide a better image, but they may be less desirable uh, in the long run. Do uh, you think there could be a, pro a progression? We could start with systems that used eyewear and then evolve to systems that didn't require eyewear? Anybody, I mean, my feeling is yes. I think there could be a, a slope that allows for adoption, and I think just like the solution was kind of being worked out right now with HD, DVD, and Blu-ray, you get competing systems out there, and the infrastructure, uh, if you've got the streaming and the content, can do decoding on back-end side, so it isn't really relegated to which system you have, what 3D experience you're going to get. Uh, you can let the consumer choose, uh, in the end, what's the best system for them. Okay. I, I absolutely think yes. I mean, 
just looking at the audience, uh, most, of, most of us are wearing glasses, and, and I just don't think it's all that obtrusive for, for us to switch glasses. Um, I also think that, that maybe there's a, a different uh, usage model, to, to some extent getting to Julian's point. You know, a, a guy who is focused on, on playing a game in, in 3D is probably much more conscious about putting on a pair of glasses than somebody who is lying down with a beer on their couch watching television. And, and so I think maybe that, that there's an intermediate step, not, not just on in the home, not just on wearing glasses, but but, but on how we, we use uh, stereoscopic displays in the home. But it's also a question, I think it was raised, of what the marketplace can absorb. I think art raised that issue for many years, in fact decades, televisions were three or four hundred dollar devices that would last for you know, 10 or 15 years. Now in the past few years, people are buying thousand and two thousand dollar television sets. So the market has gone through an incredible convolution. It's an enormous change. So could, it, could it stand another one if stereoscopic television is uh, um, introduced? While we're only part way through the introduction of um, high def. Well, people aren't going to buy a second TV to watch 3D. So it has to be the primary television that provides the 3D experience. Now, I believe they certainly can expect a degree of penetration from 3D systems that have eyewear, especially if it allows eyewear to be added to existing TVs, DLP and liquid crystal TVs, for example. But my take on the situation is, is that that will be a relatively smaller win that the big win where every single person has one in their house will be when it's auto stereoscopic and that the quality of the 3D image allows you to watch TV with the same degree of convenience and comfort as the underlying 2D displays we see today. Okay, with that, yeah, Jump please. Here. Uh, I want to I have a couple things here. We covered a lot of ground since uh, I guess Julian stood up, and I want to go back to my my four places where 3D will be in the home. Okay, in your pocket, in your office, in your home theater if you have one, and in your living room. And uh, I do believe that uh, the introduction of 3D uh, content in your home is most likely to come through things that are going to be in your pocket and maybe in your office. Uh, as far as glasses go, again, I'm going to go back to my four areas. You know, in your pocket, it's a single, probably most likely a single user. You're going to pick it up, you're going to look at it, you're not going to put on your glasses. You're going to want to look at it and put it back in your pocket, maybe look at it for a little while. So I don't, I don't believe glasses are, are going to be the first choice in that kind of scenario. Um, but also from a technology standpoint, um, things that you put in your pocket have fairly high turnover rates. You know, you might buy a new cell phone every year. Um, you're not going to buy a new TV every year. Uh, in your office, again, it's most likely going to be a single user. Uh, I don't see glasses as a major problem um, when you're sitting in your office. You're used to grabbing your mouse, you're used to typing on a, a keyboard, you're used to doing different things than you're used to doing in your living room. So. I don't see putting on a pair of glasses in your office is going to be that big of a deal. In your office, you're, you're likely to get IPTV. You might get the content over the internet. You're probably going to get some introduction of 3D material um, in your office before it comes into your living room. Um, in your home theater, Again, that's, that's an event type of atmosphere. Families go in there, it's multi-user. Families go in there, they eat popcorn, they watch a movie for a couple of hours. They put on their glasses, they, they sit back and they laugh and they enjoy the movie and they get up and they go to bed. So glasses I don't see as a, as a major problem in home theater, but again, in home theater, that's not the type of turnover that you have in your pocket. Home theater systems are bought, what, once every 10 years. In your living room and your TV, you know, I have to agree with Art, that's a, that again is a, is a, is a multi-user experience. People come and flop down on the TV, the whole family sits around and watches TV and they get up and go away. In the TV industry, the average uh, viewing time per day is six hours per day. So that's about 2,000 hours per year. That's how people um, grade their, their television life. Uh, I don't watch six hours of TV a day, um, but maybe some people do, and they're not going to sit around with uh, glasses on for um, six hours a day. There's also in the industry something that's known as the wife acceptance factor, which I'm sure you've probably all heard. And whether it's perceived or whether it's real or not, 
um, I would uh, throw out there that um, that the wife is not going to want to sit around watching the rest of the family wearing a pair of glasses and she's not going to want to wear them herself. So how the wife acceptance factor plays into 3D is, is a little bit uh, unknown right now, but I agree with Art. I can't see the living room, the TV system, um, with a pair of glasses, um, but I do see glasses being acceptable in other places in the home. Well, this is very interesting, um, you know, making, as I've said, making short-term predictions about technology introduction. It's very difficult, but one thing I'm sure of, that anything that we predicted today will not come to pass. <laughs> it's all gonna come out some other, some other way. Um, and uh, it's interesting because um, digital television is a government mandated, and I guess in a, another year or so, um, analog broadcast is supposed to end, <clears throat> and people's TVs are gonna be uh, obsolete. That, that'd be very interesting to see if the uh, guys in Congress can get reelected with a plan like that. Um, but I, I don't see the government mandating stereoscopic uh, television. You've got to have stereoscopic television. It sounds funny. It's almost an, an amusing idea. Um, and I don't know. I, I just don't know about people wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. You know, I've been involved in the design of uh, eyewear for many years. And uh, it's something you wear on your face. You care about how you look, and it's got uh, very difficult ergonomics. Um, people want to be comfortable. So um, I had up until recently thought that uh, stereoscopic displays in the home would not connect with the public if I were, were required. Lately, I've changed my mind. I think maybe early adopter system, systems in home theaters, that, that could happen. Um, but we'll see. Uh, we have a question here. Yeah, I have a question. My name is uh, Robert Palberetti. I'm from uh, Philips Research, so representing uh, Philips uh, that was discussed uh, during the panel uh, or in the panel already. And I have a question related to, uh, to uh, the display, uh, uh, say the different types of displays that you could have in the home. And uh, indeed we envision that uh, an autostereoscopic uh, solution is something that, uh, that consumers uh, would uh, would like in their living room, although we don't rule out other solutions, of course. But I think there is a question that I would like to, to pose to the, to the panel that's related to content. I think if you uh, talk about, uh, say, uh, multi-view displays, then uh, say content is, uh, is uh, the challenge for content is maybe a bit different than uh, for stereo. Uh, so Lenny already pointed out, if you uh, shoot a movie uh, for IMAX uh, theater, then uh, you can reasonably well view it uh, on, a, on a stereo pair. But for multi-view, say, there is, uh, there's also another challenge to see, say, how are you going to generate those multiple images? And uh, in our labs and uh, in the uh, digital science area, we have very good experience with uh, the so-called image and, uh, and depth format, which is slightly different, say, from, uh, from doing a stereoscopic recording. And uh, we believe that this is a feasible uh, solution for, uh, for consumer uh, uh, use in the, in the home. And it's also, say, compatible uh, with, with some of the uh, 2D to 3D conversion techniques that you might want to do in, uh, in post-production. Uh, we're working on a standard. There's uh, going to be a voting in MPEG to, uh, to actually make uh, image and depth a standard. So we're trying to, uh, to get things installed there. But I want to say what the panel's view is on, uh, on this format uh, issue. Well, well, let me ask you a question since you're standing and talking. Uh, yes. Uh, what do you view the uh, timetable for the introduction of uh, the Philips uh, technology in the home. So there, <laughs> there are two things. So uh, in order to break the image and depth uh, of the, the chicken and egg uh, problem, uh, you could think of a scenario where you install a stereoscopic display in the home, but you need to do some kind of, say, uh, uh, 2D to 3D conversion in the set to be able to say enjoy 3D from the broadcasts that are out there and that could happen very fast. Uh, so uh, I think in the past our uh, 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 CE department has uh, said that it could be 2008 uh, that the 3D television uh, uh, hits the market. Uh, there has not been an announcement but it could be very fast. Uh, but do, do, yeah. you th do you think people would be happy to sit around with a 3D television in their home most of the time. For the first few years, it wouldn't function in 3D. You'd get good planar images. Every now and then, you'd get a 3D show. Would people be happy with that? 
I, I clearly believe so, yeah. yeah. But I think it also comes with, say, those early adopters that, uh, that would look, uh, use this display for, for gaming, for instance, and other applications that are really, uh, really 3D. And so we need to basically yeah, get the market used to, uh, to 3D, and uh, but we have to make it beautiful. Uh, so uh, we're working on a way on, on building end-to-end uh, -end systems to make that, uh, that first step, and we uh, truly hope that uh, people uh, will enjoy it. Uh, well, I'm very uh, impressed because I think Philips is the only company in the world that is working on an end-to-end -end solution. You're looking at the format, you're looking at how the content is created, how it's distributed, and, uh, and the display device itself. So that's, and I don't know if anybody else is doing that, do you? Uh, we believe that it, it, this is the way to do it, uh, and uh, we're trying to get other people to join us here, uh, indeed. Yeah, so right, so you're a yeah. licensing, Philips is a licensing company to a large extent, so you would, your strategy would involve getting other people to sign up, other people who exactly. make yeah. right. Yeah. And I think, going back to my comments on standards, um, it can't just be Philips. You need Sony and Toshiba and, and all sorts of other consumer electronics company uh, cooperating with you and pushing things through MPEG or, or whatever the mm -hmm. standards group is. Because um, Philips isn't going to make a standard here. It, it's got to be a, an exactly. international yeah. thing. Yeah. Right, well, uh, you know, uh, the RCA uh, created the NTSC group uh, to give the imprimatur of a, uh, of a standards body. Uh, and, uh, you know, Philips may need to do something like that. I, I know in Japan they've created a, this 3D consortium possibly for a similar purpose, but it's unclear now uh, whether their goals and objectives will be met or even what they are. Um, yeah. And I was just wanting to add that we're seeing more of the, you know, the Silicon guys and uh, some of the software people, you know, Intel has been around here uh, this week. You, know, you guys, I want to laud you guys for continuing to come at the problem and add to the end-to-end -end part of the solution. But in, in getting to what Art was saying, if we want 3D to be in basically structured in the next-gen television, format specifications. We got to make a compelling case for people to want to get there. And that's where I think intermediate implementation, you know, gradual step up. Okay, am I missing? It's it's a formidable problem. Uh, you know, you can even ask yourself whether or not people will want stereoscopic television at home. Uh, I lived through a transition in computer graphics that some people may remember. Uh, 25 years ago, it was questioned whether or not color computer graphics were required. Uh, and uh, I, it was seriously debated. People wrote papers on the subject. But I think the decisive factor was that people could go home and watch a color television show. Uh, so if you could have a color TV at home, why couldn't you have a computer that output color? Um, and now I think uh, with uh, uh, the proliferation of stereoscopic cinemas and more content, I think people will uh, be educated to the, to the possibilities of the stereoscopic cinema. I think a very good step in the right direction took place about 20 years ago when theme parks began to adopt the stereoscopic cinema as a special venue in, in their locations. So um, I think you know, progress is being made, but it may take a long time before we get the significant penetration. Um, anybody have any uh, comments? We, you know, we welcome more comments from the uh, folks here. And I see somebody coming up, racing up to the man in purple. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is uh, Walter Funk, and I've been involved with uh, using auto stereoscopic displays and volumetric displays in the sense of a performance art, performing live. So I've had some experience with um, multi view displays and real world situations. And one thing that I came across, which we would all take consideration with the multi view displays, is that it's going to be different for a personal form of entertainment, such as a video game, as opposed to a passive form of entertainment as a movie, where you have a person sitting on a couch and they have their view here and you have someone else sitting there, you know, you're not going to get one person all of a sudden running across this side, the mother here and the father there, and clashing each other in the room where you might get that in a, in a sense with a video game, you have one person going back and forth with the horizontal and vertical parallax. 
So for content providers, that's going to be an issue too. Of, of imagine a filmmaker, they have a, a, t a regular stereo movie, they can put you right in a very specific seat, in a very specific place, which is a very useful tool for a filmmaker. But all of a sudden, we have all these multi-views, that opens up a whole new realm for creative producers, for a, a movie maker. Right, I guess it would depend on where you were sitting in your room. You'd see you, the filmmaker might not be able to completely control the uh, shot. Right. Exactly, and also as a form of passive entertainment where people are sitting on a large, maybe in a larger situation, people aren't going to necessarily be able to take advantage of the multiple views. All right, we're working now with uh, filmmakers who are wrestling with the uh, issues involved in making stereoscopic movies. It's a, very interesting to see these smart guys uh, figu figuring out how to do it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of fun. We have some people here who, um, you know, you mentioned gaming and there are some folks in the room from NVIDIA who uh, I'd like to hear from. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if we have uh, Dave Cook is here or some other guys from NVIDIA. You know, I, I'd love to hear some comments from you along the way about whether or not you think that uh, we're going to have stereoscopic uh, games in the home sooner rather than later. And also, you've got some experience with uh, stereoscopic games on CRTs uh, in the past. So, you know, if you'd volunteer and come on up, I'd like to hear what you have to say. We have another uh, gentleman here. Uh, sir, would you introduce yourself? No, no, go ahead. And then well, is this, is this a comment? Okay, sure. Okay, we've got right, Dave Cook from question. NVIDIA, who's championed... Uh, okay. okay, I'm uh, Chris Chinock with Insight Media. Uh, I have a question about uh, actually the broadcasters. Um, we've talked a little bit about how content might come into the home via uh, DVD uh, or Blu-ray or IPTV. Um, and the, I think um, there's a, uh, perhaps a question about the broadcast, the over-the-air broadcast part of this. Do you, I'm asking the panel, have an opinion on whether the broadcasters will be absolutely obsolete and dinosaurs in the 3D era, or is this a way for them to play and get relevant again? Does somebody want to take that? <laughs> You, you, so the, Im, the implications of the broadcasters are now irrelevant. Well, well my, I guess my, the question is, I, I I'm wonder whether the over-the-air transmission of broadcast 3D uh, is going to be the delivery medium for 3D. Yeah, but you have many choices now that you did not have in the past. There were many ways. You can use your television set to look at stereoscopic content. And, um, I, I don't know the answer. I, I, it's very hard to know. All right. Chris, I guess I'd like to take your question and, in a certain sense, expand it. You're asking how will the broadcast people make money when the 3D uh, becomes pre prevalent. I think it's a, a worthwhile question to ask how will all players make money on 3D? That's what drives it. That's the engine that it ultimately will make. 3D proliferate into everyone's homes. How will advertisers be able to use 3D to make more money than they do? Right. Um, You're forgetting about the audience. I don't know. I don't know how the audience is going to make out in this equation. <laughs> is the audience going to make money <laughs> or spend it? <laughs> well, it depends on what the advertisers tell them, I guess. Right. And just maybe a brief comment. I mean, a number of high-end people that are invested maybe in other methods of delivery have kind of started to forecast the end of quote unquote broadcast television. So broadcast television has a really serious set of questions they have to try to ask themselves. How are they going to participate in the media distribution system that's coming available? Perhaps 3D is a big part of that, could it be? But I, I kind of feel it's not going to be the compelling reason. I think they have to join the rest of the delivery process and well, see what's relevant. Yeah, right now you only have a handful of uh, high def channels being broadcast in any community. You can only get a half a dozen or maybe a few, maybe a few more. And to ask the broadcasters now to endure another transition, which will be costly, is it's probably an, an improbable event until uh, you reach a certain level of acceptance with regard to uh, high def or digital television. Um, so it, it may well be that broadcast television is not the avenue of the vehicle for stereoscopic images in the home. It may well be that uh, gaming is the vehicle or the television uh, or rather the movies that are being produced for real cinemas and IMAX cinemas. That may be 
uh, available on Blu-rays or HD DVDs. That may be the way it will enter. Um, but I, I can't believe the broadcasters would be the first to adopt it simply for economic reasons and because they're enduring a transition now that's very costly. So we have uh, our next speaker or uh, audience member. Hey, my name's Scott Vory. I'm with NVIDIA. And I agree with you 100%. The, the real issue is, is stereoscopic technology a compelling experience for consumers? We can provide all kinds of hardware and software, but unless we deliver something that is truly unique and compelling, people aren't going to buy it. And if we do, they will pay an enormous amount of money for it. I think if you look at the HD TV revolution, I, I market our uh, Blu-ray and HD DVD technology as well as stereoscopic, you'll see that what really drove it was when all those uh, sports fanatics could start seeing the blades of grass on the field or the tennis ball. That, that was it. It wasn't... Uh, it, it truly was the detail, it was a, a, a unique, compelling experience above and what, what they got with NTSC. And I don't think that we're going to deliver that with uh, over-the-air broadcast at first. There's, there's two ways so far that, that we've been talking about that are, are really a, a unique value add over what the current experience is. And one of them is 3D gaming. And so uh, obviously, you know, kind of self-serving, we're very interested in, in seeing that take off in the home. Uh, and the other is the, the 3D movies uh, on Real-D uh, cinema screens is quite a compelling experience. I think So th there's the, the two avenues that we've, we've got to figure out how to bring that into the home in, in a standardized and uh, uh, at a compelling price point. And, and that's where it's going to go. And, and once we can prove to consumers that this is, you know, this is not a flash in the pan, this is not old 1955 with geeky glasses, then there'll be a, enough uh, demand to, to, to bring broadcasters on board. Well, let, me, let me ask you a question, Scott. Uh, I lived through uh, NVIDIA uh, offering drivers and uh, uh, Jeff Ferguson at IO Displays offering uh, eyewear and other people offering eyewear. And uh, when this happened, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, there were CRT televisions, monitors, computer monitors that could play stereoscopic images beautifully. Um, why didn't it connect then, and what's different now? Well, the advance in uh, geometry processing in 3D games since that time has been phenomenal. And so the experience uh, of a 3D game that 3D gamer receives right now from uh, watching a stereoscopic game is much better than back, in, back then. In addition, we we kind of alluded to some new technologies that are coming out. So the unique thing about CRTs was, of course, that they had the speed. And as the CRTs have dwindled, the solutions haven't been there for gamers to uh, transfer that demand. And uh, with the advancement in the authoring of 3D games where they're not taking shortcuts, they're using the, the true depth information even for the leaves of a tree in the background, the experience is much more compelling than it was back then. So I, I think you could make a good argument that uh, Starry's Cop and Displays would enter the home in gaming, uh, for gaming. But uh, we'll see, and I, I, I don't really care which way it enters. I'd like to see stereoscopic uh, displays in the home. I'm a partisan. Um, so we, we'll see how this turns out. Does the panel have any comments? I'd, I'd like yeah, to Scott say one more thing. I, I, I will sit down. Um, well, I don't but mind, Scott. You can we're up. very interested in uh, seeing a standard evolve for delivering uh, the great Hollywood content into the home. And anybody that wants to work with us to do that, I'd be willing to talk to them after the panel. Okay, we have uh, Jason Goodman, who's a stereoscopic cinematographer. Hi. Can everybody hear me? The one thing that I wanted to add also is that, you know, gaming platforms like uh, PlayStation 3 and Xbox are way beyond just video games now. Those, those systems now come with uh, sort of memberships to online communities that allow you to download movies and things like that. So I really agree with what everyone is saying is that although 
standards are needed, it's interesting to see how as technology has improved, the more advanced devices are able to adapt to multiple standards. Blu-ray discs and HD DVDs use multiple different compression standards to deliver the same content on a uh, on an Apple computer or an uh, IBM or IBM, you know, on a PC, a Windows computer, you basically can run QuickTime and AVI and all these different types of MPEG formats. So there's a lot more flexibility than there was necessarily in the 1950s when you had to have a certain format or the TV just wouldn't work. So I tend to agree that 3D can kind of just sneak in there through one of these platforms. And you know, the other interesting thing that I find about the gaming platforms is that although PlayStation and Xbox and Nintendo are all uh, totally incompatible with one another, they coexist in the marketplace in a way that formats like VHS and Betamax were not able to do. So as technology advances, it seems to be able to deal with these multiple different standards. Okay, so are, are you agreeing with uh, Brett, who thinks that stereoscopic displays might enter the home in, in the pocket? Well, I think there's a place for that. Um, certainly, well, the other point that I wanted to bring up that, that addresses that is that there, I, I feel like there's been somewhat of an assumption in this conversation that in order for 3D television to succeed, everything's got to be in 3D. And as you mentioned, Lenny, there's really a small percentage of the content, even if you own an HD TV, there's a small percentage of that content that you're actually getting in HD. And I personally find myself watching fairly crappy shows that I probably wouldn't watch, but specifically because they're in HD. Right. So I think that if 3D TV was offered in a way that enhanced the normal television viewing experience, viewers, and obviously the cost has to be within reason, I think viewers would seek out that 3D programming and it's the kind of thing that would uh, sort of be self-propagating. And certainly the films that are being enabled by real D technology would be a great source of content for that. Okay. Well, I think we, we better wrap up now because uh, we've only got a couple of minutes until noon and I'd like to give each panelist an opportunity to uh, give some final thoughts. And one thing I'd like uh, everybody to do, if you can, is to make a prediction about when you think stereoscopic televisions would be in the home, uh, what year. And uh, I'll start with uh, just sort of a game, kind of a, like a parlor game. So anyway, let's we'll start with uh, Steve at the end and work our way towards the moderator in a wave. All right. Well, again, noting your point that predictions are always a dangerous thing and 100% of them generally don't take place. I think that in 2007 and 2008, you're going to start to see systems becoming available. I think gaming is going to be that platform. I think handheld devices is the other one. I don't think one has to necessarily occur ahead of the other to drive the other one, but I do think there has to be multiple for, uh, formats. And the last thing I want to kind of add is there needs to be a, a beginning of a discussion about issues related to standards and where are the needs that aren't necessarily resolved. And I think committee, not committees, pardon me, but the SDNA is a great place to start there, to try to get these other groups like Apple and like uh, Adobe to come in and participate to open their eyes up so we can make the case for the next gen television. Uh, the uh, the SMPTE has a, a, a body, a part of the DC28 Digital Cinema Group that is discussing standards for uh, stereoscopic cinema. It's possible the SMPTE could be a forum for such discussions. So let's uh, move now to Mark. The uh, conversation today relieves me a little bit because I think 3D will end up in my home um, but it won't be through television, at least as we traditionally define it. I, I, I do see 3D entering the home, probably through through gaming, but maybe through uh, handheld sorts of devices. The comments that Jason made just a moment ago, I thought were fascinating. That, that, that we have much more flexibility in terms of handling different technologies and different uh, standards, if you will, um, today than we did years ago. Um, and, and so there's an opportunity to bring 3D into the home, even if there, there is a lot of incompatibility in the, in the marketplace. And so that's, I think, real encouraging. Answer to Lenny's question, my home, mm, I'll say 2010. <laughs> okay, Art? I guess I'd like to offer a sort of a variety of comments in answer to your question. First is I always grew up loving science fiction and the future was always represented by a hang on the wall with 3D a hang on the wall television that presented in 3D. Right. We've got half of that and I just can't wait for the other half. <laughs> Having said that, um, I, I guess my feeling is is that it's not sooner, it's later. Uh, 
I think that the existing televisions are not, not that great in 3D to replace 2D televisions, so uh, they've got to be able to switch. However, I think that the, the path to make 3D televisions as good as they need to be so that everyone will want one is there. Uh, in the case of the auto stereoscopic displays, I think the prospects of making wider field of views and more views so that the images are pleasing for all of the audience, I think that the, the path is there and that it'll happen. But I put it more at five to 10 years. Brett? I have to agree with the panel that uh, 3D content is going to make its way into the home through other means than your TV in your living room. It is going to come in through, through mobile, through your computer monitor. Consumers are going to want to see and evaluate and be convinced in the 3D content before they're going to invest the money in a 55-inch TV to put into their living room. That's just the way it is. So um, I, I do expect 3D uh, content to be making its way into the home. But for me personally, uh, having three, a 3D TV in the living room where you're watching prime time broadcasts with 3D effects, uh, the, the uh, things are just not there. The content's not there. The, the transmission technology is not there. The, the, even though the human factors issues haven't been worked out completely yet, uh, the display technology probably isn't even there yet. So you know we're talking you know, optimistically uh, 20 years from now, maybe uh, prime time TVs will be shown on TVs in some living rooms. But uh, in the living room, TV is, a, is quite a long way away, in my opinion. Well, um, I'm optimistic, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I am a, I've been a subscriber of uh, popular science since I was a little boy, and they haven't predicted stereoscopic television in the home. And whenever popular science makes a prediction or features an invention on its cover, you know that it's doomed. It, it will either never uh, appear or it will, uh, you'll be a very old man before it appears. So since they haven't singled out stereoscopic television as something that will uh, be available to the consumer, I feel confident that we will have stereoscopic televisions this year. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, thanks. I want to thank the panel. Thank everybody.